Five minutes past six on Kai FM 95.9. My guest tonight is a novelist, a playwright, a person who's been involved in the making of movies, a teacher of literature, involved in HIV AIDS activism, and a keeper of bees. He describes himself as a professional dabbler. My guest tonight is the acclaimed novelist Zakes Mdar. Zakes, a very good evening, and thanks for giving us your time tonight on Kai FM. Oh, thank you for inviting me. I've got in front of me a copy of your latest novel, Little Sons. Little Sons, yeah. And I just want to read a, a very short summary in your own words of, of the book. <laughs> yes. In this historical novel, the fictional love story weaves itself into the true history of the assassination of Hamilton Hope, a British magistrate in the 19th century Cape Col- Colony, and the exile of members of my family under the leadership of Mtlontlo Kamatiwane from Kumbu to Lesotho and later to Herschel on the Cape Colony side of the Lesotho border. So a love right. story, a personal story, yes. and a piece of history. Why did you need to write that now? Well, um, I thought it was the right time because um, I started first with my uh, autobiography, mm-hmm. Sometimes There's a Void. And I mentioned briefly, you know, this incident of Mtlontlo and how we got to be uh, in that part of the Eastern Cape. Uh, And people were very interested to know the story. Well, I mean, historians know it because it's it's all over, you know. But in as far as, you know, the historical academic world is concerned. And many people were, were interested. Because, you see, now when I write it as a novel, mm. uh, more people have access to that story um, than, um, than ever before. So I decided that, well, it, it was time uh, I wrote it as a novel. And the central character, well, there are a number, but I guess the central character is mm. Malangana. Yes. Is any part of Malangana yourself? Well, I don't know because... You know, in whatever you write, there will always be part of you, you see. Uh, Malangana is a fictional character, Mm -hmm. although he's named after a real ancestor. But he is a fictional character. He is a character who drives the story. Because in my view, historical fiction is much more effective when it is driven by, you know, fictional characters. So Malangana and his love interest, Mtwagas, are completely fictional. Um, But then, of course, as is the case with most fictional characters, there will be bits of you, bits of somebody else, and so on. They are always composite. We we think they come from our imagination, but they really come from the people we know, including ourselves. Just to, I suppose, and, and, and I hope I do this justice, but to outline mm. the, the main threads of the story. There's Malangana and the, 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 the story moves between time, although not over huge uh, periods of time. Yes. There's Malangana who, as a younger man, is involved in the conflicts in his community, both between different African tribes, if I can call them that, but also with the British who are imposing uh, a set of unreasonable rules on the place. There's his love for a woman, Mtuakazi, which is... That uh, is the main story. Which is a painful story in many ways. Um, And then there are other things going on as well. The one thing that really struck me about the second... the the political history is that as painful as there is as you represent the imposition of British rule, perhaps more painful is the conflict and the willingness of groups to side with the British against other African people. Were were you trying to specifically make that point, or is it a point you've been making for years? Well, I was not making that point Mm. at all, Mm -hmm. because it is history. Yes. It is what happened, you see. That's what made colonization possible, is because... You know, some of the groups, you know, were in conflict amongst themselves. And then others, of course, went into alliances, formed alliances with the British. Other groups formed alliances with the Trek Boers. You, you, you see, um, they did whatever wa- they, they thought was to their advantage at the time to get the upper hand in their own conflicts amongst themselves, you know, as different 
nations as they were at yes. that time because each one of those were not tribes you know the the word tribe came with a, with a colonialists each one of them was a sovereign mm. nation mm. completely independent of the others the abatembu were a sovereign people with their own king their own government amampondo mise the same amampondo amaxhosa were a different group also you know which were amaqaleka and amagagabe you see uh, um, and they were all also a, a sovereign uh, group so these were actually nations um, and sometimes of course since they were all living in the same uh, neighborhood so to say the same part of africa there would be conflicts you know mm. uh, over cattle over borders and, uh, and, and 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 so on and when the british came of course you know some of those groups you know uh, would then you know side with the british uh, when it was their advantage mm. uh, to their advantage to do so you know, see and in the end they were all losers well of course at the end of the day they were all colonized you mm. see by the british and then put under one umbrella and uh, you know they were, then they were you know they all became closers whereas the closers were only one one of the group of the groups you see um another thread in the book is those members of the community who were drawn manipulated whatever it was into becoming christians and others like malangana who had a fierce hostility to that say, say more about the importance of that well o- of course christianity came into play and uh, some of the people were converted uh, others were not with the, with the, which then of course complicated the conflicts uh, the, the themselves a lot of those who were converted you know would from time to time you know be part of an alliance with the missionaries and therefore the british government um, at other times they would rebel against that and form their own sects and their own religious groups you you, you see uh, so it was a complex uh, situation like that your your protagonist malangana speaks his mind on this he talks about christmas and you describe all the festivities and there's this day where there's feasting and that day where there's feasting right. malangana and you put uh, malangana says as for malangana he hates the season with all his heart he's grateful that he discovered this refuge the old ruins of the jail he hates all enforced merriment gaiety by decree of the white man's book Right. Yeah. <laughs> and 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 the thought then on Balangana and what mm. you say is the central story, the love story, which is it a is it a painful story? I found it painful, but maybe it oh, isn't. Yeah. Well, I mean for me <laughs> it is not painful. Okay. Uh it is a joyous story, you know, because it is a story of persistence and resilience. Um because you see what happens is malangana is in love with this mtwagazi a, a, a girl at the time yes. and when they are about to marry then the, the war breaks out uh, and uh, he has to go to exile in lesotho and he's there for 20 years and when he comes back he's old and broken old not because of age you know he has aged you know because yes. of, because of longing and a broken heart you know longing from twagas and he comes back in search of this woman and the, the the search of course is very long and arduous because uh, she's no longer where she used to be but you know things work out well in the end that's that that's what counts you see it is when when you describe it as joyous and it's fascinating that i read it as so painful and, yes. you, and you say it's yeah. joyful but but there we go um <laughs> is that yeah. is that because you find well i mean painful because love yes, yes. love is painful in in many instances so so that's what, what i was going to ask you do do you believe that the fact of being madly crazily in love is itself a thing of joy however it ends it's is, is that of, part of your philosophy no no it's, it's a thing of great pain okay 
great, great We're pain. We're swapping sides. I'm now Joy, you pain. Yeah, it, 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 <laughs> it, it is agony, in yes. fact. Yes. The, the issue of exile is, mm. is, was also a fact of your own life and yes. a fact of the life of your father to, to whom you dedicate the book. Uh, you say he made the present possible, Ashby Peter Solomzi Mda. Many yes. people would know him better as A.P. Mda, one of the founders of the ANC Youth League. Yes. Tell us a little bit about your thoughts on exile and the extent to which maybe they weave their way into the book. Well, I mean, you see, my, my family was exiled twice. Yes. We were exiled at first when Mshontlo, you know, after Mshontlo assassinated uh, the magistrate Hope in 1880. Then we, ha- we had to trek all the way from Kumbu, which is, was in what was called the Transkai, mm-hmm. uh, to Lesotho, where we were welcomed by the, the Maputi people there. Um, and then we were there for a, a number of years. Some of us stayed there. Uh, actually, if, if you go to Lesotho now, there are many mm-hmm. Mda people, you know, with, with, with that last name, who have been there since then, and they are Basotho people now. Yes. But uh, some uh, uh, some of us went back to to to, uh, to, to the Cape, and then A. P. Mda then was involved in ANC issues. Uh, he he was one of the founders of the ANC Youth League. Actually, he was the president of the ANC um, Youth League. Um, and then in later years, he was exiled to Lesotho again. Mm-hmm. That was our second exile. And when we went to exile in Lesotho, actually we were going home because there were many of us already who had been there since 1880. Is exile more painful when the distance um, between where you are and where you would like to be is, is just... A relatively small river, or do you think it would would have been more painful to have been in New York or London? Perhaps the latter. Why? Because when, as I say, when, when we went to exile in Lesotho in 1963, um, which is, was our second exile, mm. we were going home really because we already had our people there, you know. Um, so and also Lesotho is just next door, you know, just across the border. And it is the same cultural milieu. We, we didn't have to learn a new language. We didn't have to immerse ourselves in a new culture. We were from just across the, the border in Herschel, in the Eastern Cape, yes. where my grandfather was the chief. And he was the chief of people who spoke Kosa, Lesotho, and Seputi. You know, and those were the languages that we spoke already. So exile was home. I want to ask you, just just to wrap our conversation about Little Sons, what was the writing of the book like? Are you a fast writer? Is is writing difficult? How did that book come out of you? I I'm a very fast a fast writer normally. Yes. If for instance, I'm writing a book like Ways of Dying, which mm-hmm. took me about two two months or so right. uh, to, to write because I didn't have to go out and do research and so on and so forth. But a book like Little Sons, where I needed to, to do a lot of research to go to the archives in Grahamstown, to go to Cape Town where they have a lot of uh, material on these issues and to meet the descendants, for instance, of the guys who were killed by, by my grandfather uh, who are still there in the Eastern Cape, you know, and who have a lot of material, uh, the letters and so on, that uh, they, they, their great-grandfather left. and so. You see, they, 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 there was a lot of that. Uh, so it took me a year or so to write. Zakes, you've been paraphrased as saying, I don't have the exact quote, that historical fiction allows us to reflect also on the present. Was that something that, that you were trying to do with Little Sons? And if so, what reflections do you consider important? You don't even have to try to do that. Yes. Because, I mean, as a writer, I live in the present. Mm-hmm. And my ideologies my biases are informed by the present. So even when I write about the past, those come into play. The very fact 
of selection, for instance, what I select, what I leave out, and so on and so forth, is informed by who I am mm -hmm. today. Yes. You, 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 you say that. So it cannot help but be about the present, you see. And in fact, you will find that the, the present or, you know, uh, the past, whether we, we like it or not, will always be a strong presence in the present. A lot of the issues that we are dealing with today are issues that the past has, de has dealt with, uh, you know, uh, or already, because history just continues to repeat itself, just like that. So all those factors, you know, make historical fiction to be more about the present than it is about the past. Sometimes it is about the present consciously, yes. as I did with the sculptors of Mapungubwe, where I was writing about the past but addressing today's issues. But sometimes just automatically, by the mere fact that history does repeat itself, by the mere fact that we are the products of that past, and therefore, of course, it still resonates even in today's life. You speak of the issues of the present. What are they for you? Well, I mean, it, it depends. There, there are a million issues of the present. In South Africa is currently, it, South Africa's no, I'm, uh, I'm political issues? I'm talking about in South Africa. Th there, there are a million issues, you know. Uh, so it depends what issue one is zooming into. For instance, after Little Sons was published, mm -hmm. you see, uh, then a lawyer from either Johannesburg or Pretoria, I don't remember, but an advocate of the High Court wrote to me, actually on Twitter, you see, mm -hmm. <laughs> because that, that, that's how we, we, we communicate, uh, that, hey, this book you wrote, you know, seems to be prophetic because it, it actually addresses today's issues. So I'm, I, I was asking, w w which issue specifically? Well, as a lawyer, of course, the issues he would be interested in are uh, issues pertaining to law and so on. So, you know, in fact, the conflict that hope has with the chief, where, of course, the struggle is, is, is about judicial powers. Yes. You know, uh, the chief as a traditional leader feels that, you know, the magistrate who's coming now with the British law uh, is imposing that on traditional values and so on, you see. And then he cites the case of, uh, what's the name of that Dacha smoking uh, uh, king? Dalindiebo? Yeah, Dalindiebo, who's in prison and is also citing issues like that. So if he says, now this is replaying itself in this, you see. Now, when I wrote the novel, I knew nothing about that. I mean, it, yes. it, it had nothing to do with that. But there he is, as an advocate of the high court, sees some of the conflicts, you know, about law and legal issues of the past, replaying themselves, you know, in this novel, uh, in the present also, you, you, uh, you see. History in the present, you, you, you spoke before the break about visiting the family of, of a man who had been murdered by your grandfather. Henman was one of the people uh, who, was, who was associated with Magistrate Hope. What can you share with us about that meeting? Well, I mean, I, I, I never really visited okay. the, the, the family, but uh, I, I corresponded with this guy uh, who is now a, a, a pastor of one of these charismatic okay. churches. Uh, whose mother is a descendant of Henman, who was one of the three guys who were supposedly assassinated. Well, not supposedly, because they were actually mm. assassinated. Uh, but, I mean, by my grand grandfather and his people. And the mother has kept a lot of, um, of, 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 of the letters, in fact, um, and 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 a lot of records and diaries that um, Henman kept, you know. So this guy was quite willing to share some of this information with me. I met him once in Grahamstown, mm -hmm. not 
at his base, not w- w- with a family. Right. But, but you know, and uh, w- w- so he was able to, to, to share uh, that kind of material with me. How did you introduce yourself in the first letter? Well, I mean, in the first letter, I, I introduced myself as, as me, Zeik Zumda, who is writing um, uh, this book. Um, and also, of course, who is a dis- descendant of of of, of Mlond, you see. And he knew the history as well. Well, he knows the history because even he has more material than yes. than I had. Sometimes material sits in boxes yeah, and yeah, family yes, never yeah. open them. But he obviously engaged with it. Yes, mm-hmm. and also previous historians who have written on on Mlondlo have consulted him. Okay, you see, I, actually, I I think I got to know of him. From one of the historians uh, in 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 Ohio, who has written a book on this issue. Zach, let's let's talk about some current things that that are happening. Mm-hmm. Uh, a play at the Market Theatre, working with John Carney. Yes. The dying screams of the moon on Twitter. You said there's a a story behind this play. Uh, ah. Is there a a version you want to share with us? Oh, I I I said that. Yes. Well, I think I was responding to something. Well, to a specific question. To yeah. a specific question. Yeah. Yes, of course. Well, I mean, this play was written many years ago. It was written during that period of uh, Cordessa, when there were the negotiations and so on, which is more than 20 years ago. Mm. Uh, and it addressed specific issues during that period. You know, it, this was a period when exiles were coming back. Uh, and also, you know, there were the negotiations for peace and so on. And one of these characters then is one of those exiles who, who was coming back, who was also, of course, in the go- guerrilla armies, you know. Mm-hmm. I don't specify for which movement and so on. Um, and then uh, when he arrives, then he goes straight to where his village used, I mean, her village, it's a woman. Yes. Where her village used to be, it is now a farm, um, you know, which, which had been, you know, you remember there used to be white, white spots uh, during those days right. when, of course, people would, would be removed uh, from their a whole village, mm. you know. To, uh, so he finds that, she finds that um, that village is no longer there. Um, and she goes to the church, you know, where, where she used to, to worship, where she encounters um, the lady, the daughter of the farmer there. And, of course, they find that they have a lot in common because she was also in the military, in the South African Defense, Defense Force. Yes. But then they also discover that this woman, the, f- the former guerrilla fighter, has come to claim her land back. So the, the 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 conflict then begins there, you know. Uh, so it, it it addresses the the play the, the the play addresses the issues of land, you see, which you hear about a lot today. But those days, of course, very little was being said about um, about the people getting their land back, you know, which uh, especially. People who were m- moved away as recent, I mean, I mean, in living memory. Yes, that is, and their villages were were, were, were taken over, um, and they were m- moved to, to 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 other places, and uh, she she wants her land back, and now, the play was not performed at the time mm-hmm. after I wrote it, because you'll remember that this was a period of euphoria. And, you know, uh, the Rainbow Nation and so on. And now here it was coming with other issues of, 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 of conflict, you see, th- that I felt were not being resolved even by the negotiations, were not being resolved uh, properly to the satisfaction of the people who lost their land, you see. And many producers then did not want to touch it. So that's why it wasn't produced. It wasn't a reluctance on your side. It was people saying, not, not this, not now. I wanted to be produced. I mean, why, why, why would yeah. I have any reluctance? Yes. Because I wrote it. Yes, I yes. wrote it to be produced. But many producers, 
uh, well, I won't mention names, um, did not want to, to have anything to do with it. Pre- and, the, 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 and precisely, and they, they said so straight out that, uh, you know, it is messing up the, the euphoria which was there, you know, and is coming up now with other issues, you know, that um, were conflictual and so on. So, until some small producer did it in 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 uh, in the former Buputazwana in Mabana, I think mm-hmm. was, was the name of uh, the company that did it, and I think John Carney saw it there and remembered it. So many years later, in other words, last year, he approached me and said, "Hey, you know." There's a play I once saw uh, that you wrote, and I want to do it. I no longer remembered it. Completely. He tried to describe it and so on. Yes, and you couldn't remember it. I, I couldn't, because, I mean, it, it's so many years ago, and I've written many other things after that. A few million words since then. Yes. And then when he... And he found that... Well, he came with a title, you know. I think it was something about the moon. And so, the dying screams of the moon. It came back to me. But now I didn't have any copy of that. I mean, you know, uh, I've moved and so on, you know. Amazing. So he had to search for it. He, I, I had to try to remember to which producer did I send it. But none of those people had it anymore. Until fortunately, he found, he found an old copy at the National uh, Museum of, uh, of, of Literature or whatever it's called. Of English literature, yes, Nelm, I think, mm-hmm. in Grahamstown. That's how then this play was retrieved. That's how it came back to life. Do you, do you have a feeling then about the current political entanglements that we're in now, in relation to what you were saying that in in those early nineties, s- critical things were not resolved. How much yes. of our current political difficulties are due to that, that our transition was a partial one in the way that so many people are saying more openly now than they would have then? Definitely. You see, there, 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 there are many issues that were not addressed. Um, but, but of course, I mean, I do understand because this was a negotiated settlement. Yes. And in a, in, in a negotiation, you know, it's a give and take kind of, situation and there were issues that were put aside that okay maybe we are going to address these the, 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 these later and this is one of those issues and now people are talking about these things because they they find that th- they, these issues were never addressed you know and they are coming up now and they are coming out now um, in a manner of course that is no longer as friendly as it it would have been if mm. they had been addressed then, you, you see. You, I'm coming back to the suns for a moment, and the descriptions of the land are incredibly rich. It's, it's a mm. tapestry in which the, the characters play out, in it, and it's a very powerful one for me who doesn't mm. know that world particularly well. And, and my yes. question to you is this. Is the failure to address the land issue, clearly it's, it's of economic significance, but do you think the yeah. bigger damage is a psychological one where people remain feeling dispossessed, even if, for example, they may have a job and money. Yes. Well, I mean, land is life, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, it is not only important to those who are farmers, you know. It is, an, it is, it is as you say, it's a psychological issue. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an emotional issue. It's a, it's a moral issue as well, you know. It's, it's an ethical issue. You see, it's, it's many issues, you know, in the world. Many of the people who are talking about land now, it's, it's not like uh, they want to be farmers uh, uh, tomorrow yes. and so on, you know. But, you know, our lives, you know, are, are centered on, on that. You know, land is life, you, you, uh, you see. Um, and the fact that, in, in fact, people in living memory, not even land that was lost uh, during Mushontlo's time, 
because even then, you know, uh, uh, land was, was lost. A, land of, a, a lot of land was lost in living memory. Some of us do remember, for instance, where, when my village was moved in, yes. in, in, in the Eastern Cape there from where it was and we were taken down to another place which was far and foreign from where we used to be. Fortunately, I got part of that myself, which is where I have my beekeeping project, you know, from the old place. But many, many people, you know, have not, uh, never got uh, th their land back, you see. So that's a very emotive issue. Even for me, who's a professor mm. there in Ohio, and then when I come back here, I'll be a professor or somewhere or work at the market theater and so on. And perhaps I won't even be a farmer, but my people are farmers, you know. And they were taken away, they were moved away from where they used to be and where we had a life, you, you see, and we had our fields and so yes. on. And they would, they would love to recapture that life that we used to, 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 to have then. Zakes, your, your book, The Well Caller, is being made into a movie. Yes. And, and I'm fascinated about that process. Uh -huh. Does a novelist to some degree have to surrender his work to the filmmakers in, in the belief and trust, presumably established in conversation, that they're going to do it justice? Or did you remain fairly hands-on with the project? Well, I mean, it depends. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, normally they option the novel... And after that, you have nothing to do w with it, you, 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 you see. But in this case, it was different because the, the guy who optioned the story decided to involve me. Uh, he commissioned me to write the script. So I wrote the script. And then I also became a co-producer, you see. So uh, I was involved uh, 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 throughout. But that, that is not the norm. Yes. You see, that is not the norm. The norm is that they option your book, they pay you the fee, uh, and then goodbye. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then they do what they do. They adapt it, you know, to suit their, 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 their own needs. And even that never worries me because I've, I've actually optioned other stories of mine where I will not be involved. I just happened to be involved in the, in the whale collar because Zola Maseko wanted me to be involved. But otherwise, um, in many instances, my work is optioned. Then they will script it the way they want it yes. and interpret it in their own way. It bothers a lot of writers. But with me, it never bothers me for two re oh, Well, for one reason. Because if they mess up that that movie, you know, they mess up my story. Right. Well, my readers know my, my, my novel. Yes. They say, that's a lousy movie from a great novel. So I win. But if they do a wonderful movie, I win still. Because they say, oh, that's a great movie from this wonderful novel. And so, so in both cases, I win. I wonder if, if this dilemma had arisen, and I don't know if it did, where in the making of South African stories, um, there's often uh, pressure from a foreign funder who says, uh, you know, we'd love to cast John Carney in that, but in fact, if we don't have Morgan Freeman, I can't sell it. If you'd been presented with that dilemma, would not necessarily on this story, but, uh, but on another, would you have felt you wanted to fight for a South African to be represented, well, or do you let it go? It's not even a question of if. Yes. That's exactly how it happened. Okay. That's why this movie uh, took 10 years to make. Okay. It was precisely because there would be funders, sometimes even local funders. Right. Our own local money who would insist that, okay, we do have the money, but we would like you to cast a bankable actor. When they say a bankable actor, of course, they mean a Hollywood actor or a British actor who has a Hollywood profile. The Hollywood profile is crucial. Yes. And Zola Maseko was strong enough to say no. Mm. So, you know, he struggled a lot because he was insisting 
on casting South Africans. He had an experience because he had made a movie before called Drum, where he was forced to cast an American, Tay Diggs, you see. As Ken Temba. As Ken Temba. Yes. And uh, many people were not pleased with that movie. And, you know, Tay Diggs is, is good. I mean, he's, he's a good actor. But, of course, he didn't interpret that character as a South African actor would have done. You, you see that? And, of course, having learned from that experience, he was very adamant and very stubborn. He said, I would rather starve, and he did starve. Mm. for the 10 years until I can get some funding which will allow me to cast South African actors. So it, it, it just depends. Some other film producer w- would, w- would have given in, as they often do. Why? Because here is money. Yes. You don't want to starve. You want to make the movie. So you'll cast a Hollywood uh, actor. You see, so when you see a, a Hollywood actor in our movies, it's not because those producers wanted to; mm. they are forced to, you know, by the money. I have to say, this is just as an aside, but as a consumer, when I see a South African story with an American cast, I actually find it quite off-putting because I'm really keen to see exactly. how a so- South African would do that. But clearly, I'm a market of one, so P- people don't I can't learn. Generalize. Yes. They, they they don't learn the lesson. Yes. For instance. So he did very well, more than all the movies that that cast Americans. Yes, because you know it had that authenticity, South African actors and so on, and it, 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 that's why it won those awards and so on. A lot of the movies, in fact, almost every movie that we have we, we have made here, where we cast American actors, have failed internationally. Yes, sir. Let's talk a little bit about international and about life in the United States. You teach creative writing at Ohio University. You're in a, I assume, small university town, Athens, Ohio. And you've been Mm. there for for a number of years. Yes. Tell us about life there and and what it is that you enjoy. Well, you know, I first went there in 1981 Mm -hmm. as a student, you know, to do my master's degree. And of course... I established myself there. After finishing my studies there, I taught there. I came to Cape Town briefly to do my PhD and then went back to teach there. And then came back then during our, soon after our freedom in 1994 and taught at VEDS for about a year and so on. And then worked for seven years as a full-time writer here. But then of course, you know, I'm trained in many in many things that I wanted to apply here, yes. but could not get employment for political reasons and so on. Then I had to go back to my old job, you know, in Ohio. So I, because I'd been there for many years, you know, I have a home there uh, and uh, I'm I'm established there. In the same way that, of course, I have a home back here. I'm established. I have projects. I have a beekeeping project with rural women in my old uh, grandfather's village and so on. So I live in those two worlds now. I I am more of a commuter, really, long distance commuter because I'm back here after every two months since I have lots of projects that that, that I do uh, at home here as well. This... This role of being a teacher of creative mm. writing when you're yes. a writer yourself, I would have thought it, it's quite a subtle and sensitive skill because uh. there must, in some people, and, and you'll tell me about yourself in a moment, there must, in some people, be almost an impatience of uh, to just do it this way, whereas what presumably your job is to do is to unlock what that person has Exactly. I mean, How do you go about it? I can't impose my own style yes. on them, you know. Because you, you need to be a natural. You, you need to draw out their own, you know. Um, you teach them the craft, of course. But you can't teach the vision. Yes. The, the best we can do is to teach the craft and the technique and so on. Uh, and then they develop, you know, their, 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 their own artistic vision, you know. And, of course, their own approach their own style and so on 
and you na you nurture them from that position rather than imposing your own because you don't want to create a whole lot of little zigs and does yes. all all over the place they must be themselves is it does it have moments of of visceral excitement when you get a piece of work from someone and you think wow this is this is something special oh they there's a lot of that that mm. that happens but the excitement comes more when they get published okay and become you know established right although some of them come to do you know come to my university as published writers already mm -hmm. all they want is a degree a phd so that they can go back to teach you know because it's very difficult to to teach in america without a phd you know so I have a lot of writers, you know, who who, who, who are published writers already, who take my workshops and who who are my students, uh, but I also have, you know, writers who are not published yet, and the excitement, of course, is when those get published, and then you know their first novel. Yes, it, it, it's like it, it's it's my own novel, mm. you, you know, mm. Uh, mm. is that kind of. Excitement. It feels like a, a new member of a family almost. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. So, Zex, obviously, being in the United States, you, yeah. you 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 would engage as well with the politics of that country. I notice yes. you're on Twitter at Zaxamda. Many more followers than me. Um, but really? I, I just want to share with people uh, <laughs> oh. a, an exchange where Donald J. Trump, who everyone knows, his oh. his name is by the way at Real Donald Trump. Um, I'm not oh. sure how many people would want to masquerade as him, but here we go. It says, the media is so dishonest. If I make a statement, they twist it and turn it to make it sound bad or foolish. They think the public is stupid, exclamation mark, to which at Zaik Simdar responds, no one has to twist anything. It comes out already foolish from your mouth. Uh. Do you enjoy <laughs> that about Twitter that you can... Be quick, and you can respond, and exactly. you can then move on and forget about it. Exactly. Well, I mean, it, 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 it's very easy to troll uh, Donald Trump because he's basically extremely stupid, and he, he says stupid things all, all the time. So, I mean, he's he's a soft target, really. Uh, <laughs> you see that? But he, he can be the president. Yeah. You know, there, there's that poss possibility. You know, because as you have seen already, it, it's a very tight competition. Uh, between him and Hillary uh, uh, Clinton, you see. So that tells you, you know, that however stupid you can be, you, you, you can be a president somewhere. How do you feel about a country with which presumably you have a bond um, mm. and, and a long association? How do you feel about the fact that a man like that could be president? Does it trouble you deeply? Well, I mean, look... I, I know voters already, you know, v voters have, have done worse things before. Voters elected Hitler <laughs> into power. Yes. He, Hitler didn't, didn't impose himself. So I know that the, the, the majority is often wrong, you know. I, I know that here you think majority is right. No, no, no. Majorities in most cases are wrong. And when they happen to be right, is because they've been conscientized by minorities. You see, it is a minority, those people who have more critical awareness, who then canvass the majority in order for the majority to be right. You see, in America, of course, the majority has been wrong so many times. They elected George Bush before, you know. So they, they, they can easily elect um, D Donald Trump, you know. It, it, it won't be anything new. I mean, also on Twitter, you, you, you've commented perhaps with, uh, I suppose, less amusement on the killings of, of African-Americans by the police. And you describe them as lynchings. Say, yes. more, say more about how the news and it's virtually every day of those kinds of killings makes you feel. Oh, well, I mean, it is a continuation of what has been happening from the days of slavery, you know. Uh, that culture... Is, is still embedded in, in the psyche of that nation. It, it, it can't, you know, it, it's still there, you know, I mean, black people were lynched, um, mm -hmm. uh, they, they were enslaved, um, and then there was the Jim Crow period when, you know, there were discriminatory laws and so on, and they were lynched. 
And that lynching continues today, but in different forms. It has taken a different form uh, uh, now, you know. So uh, this, is, this is nothing new. But what makes it take this new form now yes. is the panic that you find in today's America, which happens as a result that um, I think you have heard the pundits, you know, saying that it's impossible now to win elections without getting the Hispanics on your side mm. and the blacks on your side. It's impossible to win just with white males, uh, particularly. So there's a feeling that the white males are losing power, are losing the, you know, they are becoming a minority, <laughs> you, you see. Yes. And as the years go by, they are becoming more and more of a minority. And that puts them into great panic, you know, that loss uh, of, of, um, of, of power and influence. You know, with the rise of the feminist movement, on the other hand, you know, because majority of women often vote for more liberal causes, you see. Yes. Only the mi mi minority of white women vote for conservative causes, which means that then the white males who are in the majority conservative, you know, don't have enough numbers, uh, you know, uh, to win uh, national elections. With regional elections, yes, you know, uh, state elections and so on. But when it comes to national, where, you know, you'll find that the Hispanic vote counts, yes, the black vote counts, and those can actually, you know, have a, 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 an important effect in the balance. Before I forget it, because we're coming to an end, and I know it's a, a massive jump, but yes. beekeeping, your love for that, what's that about? Oh, beekeeping is something that I discovered by chance, really, when I, I went back to my grandfather's village in search of a story mm -hmm. after having been commissioned by a Dutch theater company. And then I knew there was a woman there who had a story that I wanted to tell. Mm. We, we, since we don't have time, I won't go into those details. But then I saw a very beautiful place, you know, because I had not been there for many years mm, mm. from the time I was a little, a little kid. I saw this pink mount, mountain, pink because of the aloes. Right. But I also saw the poverty. So I thought, well, pink flowers, flowers, bees. Maybe then we could start a beekeeping project here. So that, that's how then that, that beekeeping project started. Zakes, we're coming to the end of, this, the, of our time together. Mm. So before we finish, I want to give you three wishes. Okay. Which, which I have no power to grant, but All right. le le let's, <laughs> let's do it anyway. Uh. What is your wish for the community of South African writers? Well, there's more writing happening now than ever before. So my wish is that that should continue. We have quantity now. My wish is that from that quantity, quality will also emerge. And invariably, of course, it is emerging, you see. Um, that is my wish, really. What's your wish for our country? Of course, my wish is 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 that <laughs> we should. I mean, corruption should end, you know, completely, and we should go back, you know, uh, to that era that we thought was the golden age, you know, when when our democracy was new. And there was still that excitement about it, and uh, we, we we thought we were reaching, you know, to to the stars, you know, mm -hmm. um, and then of course things got messed up and so on, and we know exactly, of course, how they got messed up. That we should try, you know, to to eliminate, especially the corruption that 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 um, we find today. What's your wish for yourself? Well, I mean, I don't have any wish for myself because I'm already doing what I love, you know, and it's, it's going in the direction that I like. So I wish things should continue just the way, the way they are. Well, I wish we could continue the way we are, but we've run out of time. We could have easily spent another hour. But yeah. Zaik Samda, <laughs> thank you for the hour that you've given us here on Kai FM 95.9. It's my pleasure.